Thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to talk about APRS, APRSI servers on the beam. And my name is Kenji Kitake, and this is me. And um, actually, this is my amateur radio call sign in Japan. Okay. And all right, today I have five topics to talk. First, what, it, what amateur radio is. Number two, am, uh, subsystem of the amateur radio called APRS and APRSIS. And the third one is about a software, a tiny software I made. It's called Apress. Um, it has a word APR, something like APRS. Uh, it's a simple mapping system of the APRSIS data uh, to the uh, web browser, uh, uh, a geographical map on the web browser. And uh, the fourth part is how to implement a press. And the uh, final part is that um, my thought about the prototyping small project with Beam. OK, first of all, what is APRS? <coughs> it stands for Automatic Packet Reporting System. And it's a part of amateur radio and pro providing a short message service. Since uh, each message has to fit into a uh, protocol called AX.25, the message length is restricted to 256 bytes, or even less. And on APRS, everything is based on connectionless mode. So each station just broadcasts everything. And um, it's um, AX.25 originally has the connection mode so that originally a very old protocol of the X.25 and the telecom network did. But on, a, on the APRS, only connectionless mode is used. Okay. Right, let me explain about amateur radio. <coughs> this long text is what I, ex, what I extracted from ITU, International Telecommunications Union's radio regulation. It is actually defined as a service, although it's just a hobby. Um, because um, um, people enjoying amateur radio have a huge privilege of um, being a pioneer of the radio communications for the past 100 years or so. I'm not going to read aloud this. This is uh, simply a waste of time. So I'm going to explain in plain English. It's solely for technical experiments. No business, a, a strictly no business. You cannot uh, exchange any kind of information regarding the money transaction or whatever. And um, uh, there's a, another restriction that no cryptography is allowed on amateur radio, even for the authentication. And some people are actually arguing about it because uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's about communication safety. But uh, no radio authority allows uh, cryptographic communication on amateur radio. And therefore, no privacy. I will explain about the known privacy uh, <coughs> principle on the next slide. And the one thing uh, which, um, which is, sounds strange to, especially for the young people about amateur radio, is that you need a license. Why do I have to use it? Why do I have, have to have a license for using a smartphone, using a Wi Fi transceiver, or a Wi Fi router? Because those devices are licensed by the providers of the equipment vendors or telecom carriers, they license, they get, they get the license for you. But on the amateur radio, you are the final person to be responsible on the transceiver. So you have to have a license. And uh, it's, the activity is, of, of course, restricted, as well as other radio services. So pre-allocated radio spectrum only. And for most countries, except for United States or Canada, which is Allowing, which are allowing more freedom, third-party traffic handling is strictly prohibited. So you cannot lend your amateur radio transceiver to someone, someone else who doesn't have a license. At least, uh, it's prohibited in Sweden, and it's prohibited, strictly prohibited in Japan. Um, I have to clarify that regulation may differ in every country. So you have to check it on your own. All right. Um, about the privacy, there's a United States law, and this is legalese, um, but the United States cri criminal law explicitly defines that amateur radio 
is out of the privacy protection by any means. No one shall be unlawful to receive the signal of amateur radio or intercept or make a backup or disseminate information over the amateur radio bands by all means. So this means that um, anyone can record or rebroadcast or archive or maybe put it in the paper or, or publish on amateur radio content. So strictly no privacy. This is, um, I think, this is uh, actually a regional regulation of the United States, and your country's regulation may differ. Uh, for example, in Japan, there might be a more strict regulation on the communication privacy, or maybe in the UK. But uh, the issue is that all contents of communication of APRSIS have to be in the United States once. So this no privacy principle will apply to all communication. So then, why we enjoy, we means uh, amateur, radio amateurs enjoy such, kind of, such a hobby on the, such a restricted environment? The freedom of amateur radio is kind of very primitive one. If you are using the commercial service, you are restricted to use the given equipment, no freedom of uh, changing it, uh, hardware, changing the hardware of the or authorized devices strictly prohibited, you, you'll be, you be uh, committing a crime if you're doing so. Uh, for example, on the smartphone, for example, uh, this, this kind of uh, wireless equipment now putting over around me uh, professionally. But for amateurs in the amateur band, they have the right to create their own devices, experiment their own protocols, if allowed, and uh, create their own antennas. This is a part of the hobby of the how you, uh, it's a, um, what do say, technical hobby, right? And um, I'd, like to say, I'd like to say, um, amateur radio is the, actually, origin of the, all the internet cultures emerged after the 1980s. In, when I took the license in 1976, young kids around me, some, many of them were playing on the radio, uh, talking on the, talking on the uh, 50 megahertz band, which is a quite, quite uh, convenient for the communication between, communication between young people in Tokyo. And uh, lots of, lots of chit chats exchanged over there, like uh, young people nowadays are exchanging Twitter or something like that. So, um, to summarize, it's fun. I won't be doing this, this kind of redundant and the very time consuming stuff, even if, if it's not fun. Okay, this is, my, this is me 30, 32 years ago. <coughs> and this is Tandy 200. Tandy 200. Uh, Victoria, I, I, I've already put this in a GitHub, so you can, you can just download. <laughs> um, this is a transceiver, a kind of huge, huge one, 10 watt transceiver of 430, 432 megahertz band. And this is the terminal node controller, which is uh, actually built on the G80 chip. G80 chip and the Bell 202 modem. Yeah, and uh, this was the 1986 configuration, and now this is the 2000, actually not 2018, but 2016 configuration, and the main difference is that in 1986 there was no GPS, there was no available commercial <coughs> GPS, but this device has GPS here, and this can generate all the packets within here, so things are getting much, much more and convenient. Uh, this is so obvious when you see what smartphone can do. And, uh, and I'd, like to, I'd like to also say that even as a smartphone app, there's an uh, app for APRS IS, which generates your position to sending to the APRS IS directly without using this. So why I'm using this instead? This conserves much energy than smartphone. And when you use it, when you do the things on the smartphone, it, it consumes lots of energy. When you, use, when you do it on amateur radio, you can conserve the energy because, of, because you don't have to deal with all the receiving stuff, all the background tasks. And um, even though this is a software-defined receiver, as uh, better say, software-defined transmitter and receiver, um, this consumes less energy than the um, um, smartphone, OK? Oh, excuse me. OK, so messaging on amateur radio. It's based on um, protocol X.25. Uh, I'm not going to explain this, but uh, you, 
you can see the X.25 driver on the Linux distributions. So some people, uh, some enthusiasts in amateur radio have already put the drivers on Linux. And uh, there are two major protocols. Number one, 1200 BPS, AFSK, or AFSK, audio frequency shift keying, which you can put the output of the audio, like yeah or something, into the directory, into the transceiver, and then transmit with an uh, uh, adequate variability. And some people want the faster communication of 9600 BPS, but it won't be done by amateur radio because the, uh, the highest audio frequency of amateur radio is limited to 3 or 3.4 kilohertz. It's, it's far narrower, so it's a direct modulation of, uh, uh, how do you say, um, Gaussian minimum shift keying. That's what GMSK stands for. So, and um, the 20, 2018 style of the receiver is like this. Raspberry Pi and this USB dongle, that's it. Uh, all the, and the modulation scheme is very simple and it's easy to decode. So uh, the, all, of, all of the software are available on GitHub and even hardware schemes are available on GitHub or anywhere, elsewhere on the inter internet. So if you want to experiment, feel free to do that. Receiving amateur radio, <coughs> amateur radio transmission has, does not re require any license. And uh, as I talked about the no privacy, no privacy um, principle, you can do that. Anybody can do that. OK, so let's talk about APRS. What is APRS anyway? It's a global network of amateur radio stations connected as connected by the backbone called APRS Internet Service. It's called APRS IS, where the, in, where the internet is kicking in. And um, there's uh, already uh, aggregated information, information site uh, driven um, operated by the Finnish amateur. It's called APRS.FI. If you get access to here, you can, you can find out uh, all the public information um, mapped on the actually Google Maps, that uh, which station is where and some station there or something like that. Okay, and um, all the information exchanged on the APRS are broadcast as a text message. Okay, I'm going to skip this, but there's, a, there's even a YouTube, YouTube page for, uh, for showing you how things work. I'm going to skip this, but uh, I put the URL on this slide so you can, do, you can watch it later. Okay? And this is the Stockholm map of APRS FI. This is um, Techniska Muzet. And uh, I don't know whether you know it, but the Techniska Muzet has a huge station of a tower, uh, expandable tower, and which is operated by the Swedish Amateur Radio Association. And there's another station here, and some over there, and some over there. And if I transmit from here, somewhere, somewhere near in my, actually my hotel, near Maria Togiet, I'll be watched and uh, and uh, they are receiving all of my signal, and they put it in the APR side immediately. So it's a, actually, it's a huge surveillance system, but anyway. OK, and this is a map of Toyonaka, Toyonaka, Osaka, Japan, which is where I live. And actually, this is my station <coughs> for receiving only. And there's some certain coverage. And this is the city of Osaka. And actually, Nara is going here. And by, but, um, this is a Kyoto, and if you transmit somewhere there, somebody will pick you up. So this is not about the privacy. This is rather about the, um, um, what do you say, for safety or for the public service or in case of emer emergency, this kind of system will be uh, very useful to locate somebody transmitting um, their, um, their positions or whatever messages. So this is about APRS, IS systems. Uh, this diagram resembles quite like a Usenet or Twitter or any kind of a messaging system using the core servers uh, at the top. And um, you, ordinary clients <coughs> or radio frequency gateways uh, are not suggested to connect to the core because uh, the core, uh, core handles a lot of traffic. So they connect to the tier, tier two servers over here and uh, there are Sorry if you can't see, but there are lots of clients uh, connected to the, to the tier two servers. So, how, may, how much traffic they handle? 
um, core service has a status page, and it suggests uh, 500 to 900 kilobytes per second. Uh, the, the traffic fluctuates, but uh, it's, um, it's not as much as Twitter, but uh, it's fairly a lot of traffic. Okay, and this is the, now uh, this is the hardest part. This, is, this looks very cryptic. But these are plain text, uh, mostly ASCII, although, uh, some, although in some part Unicode UTF-8 is allowed. And this is a transmitter's cosine before the greater than mark. And this common separated string means, and the final destination here, and the one, two, three, relayed until this column. This column is actually a separator between the header part and the information part. So the structure is actually not that hard to understand once you get the, once you get the structure. And the information after here, you see some sort of numbers, this uh, and the, with N or W, which suggests north of latitude and west of longitude. So this includes the positional data, right? And uh, <coughs> what about this, this uh, exclamation mark? This ex exclamation mark is actually um, conveying the information of the type of the information after the exclamation mark, or, or, this, or the semi semicolon here, or at mark here, yeah. equal mark here. They're all different types. So what kind of information APRSIS conveys? It's about position reports, broadcast messages, maybe a bulletins, public service bulletins, or there are other things called defined objects and items. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to explain that objects are items, but you can put other kind of information such as uh, there's a, um, what do you say, um, a kind of, kind of tower is there or a castle is there or something like that. You can define towers and castles like objects. And uh, you, you'll, be, you'll be reading weather reports from some stations. And some station may send you simple telemetry dat data of some voltages or currents, which is a raw measurement data. Of, of, of course, um, uh, the meaning of semantics should be defined elsewhere. But uh, um, just sending the being able to send in the telemetry data is useful for some purpose. For example, uh, watching the radioactive, uh, radioactive radiation in the many parts, okay? So I'm going to explain my prototype of the system called Apress. Um, on, okay, let me show you this part first. Here's tier two, here's tier two server, and our own receiver just receiving the information by connecting TCP to, the, to t TCP to these servers. And I put the um, certain information, interesting information into ETS cache table. Um, namely, uh, source station cosine, and latitude data, and longitude data. And I use the Alexa web server to pick them up if the client over here, where web browser requests uh, what's happening here, so, so that the Alexa server send back the uh, data stored in ETS cache table. The system is not that hard to, hard to make, <coughs> and, but the, the, key, the key point is that um, Erlen and Alexa, two, at least two processes or two, two sets of processes are running in the same beam so that uh, they can communicate very well uh, with the ETS cache table, okay? So what all on part of our press does, it's connecting to an APR size tier two server and pulls the messages and decode them and pick up the position data and store into ETS. So it's quite simple, just using Gen TCP connect. Um, and uh, there's nothing extraordinary about this uh, in, the, in this code. It connects, and uh, when, the, when the server replies with the, so the first prompt of the identifying the server, uh, the client sends this string. This string actually includes uh, 
this is an acronym for no cosine. Um, don't use this in an actual, actual operation, but. Um, um, and the um, password minus one is this is, this is actually a generic password for recipe only stations. But um, if you are also an amateur, you can be using this, this uh, authentication field for sending messages back into APRS IS. I'm not going to explain that. Uh, this is out of the scope of today's presentation. But uh, the point is that you just connect it as a normal TCP client. And that's it. But um, one thing Erlen Gen TCP Connect a uh, good thing in Erlen Gen TCP Connect is that you can, you, you can delimit the, better say, separate each packet as lines because all APRS data ends with carriage return and line feed. So with this option, you don't have to deal with the, all those um, hassles of the finding the where the end of the packet is, and it's absolutely automated. So the code is actually very short, and, um, and, for, and for doing the pattern matching, um, not using a list, but using, rather using binaries is much faster and much easier to do, especially for byte-separated data. And this is a header decoder in Allen. And I use binary split for spreading headers or, or, or better say, uh, a, a part of the identifiers in the destination part or something. And um, one thing you have to do, uh, you, have to take, you, you, have to be you have to be careful, is that uh, for gaining the speed, you have to precompile all the binary patterns, and uh, binary pa and you pass the binary patterns to the function because uh, <coughs> using this tuple, so that uh, this function can use the binary, uh, it can use these uh, precompiled patterns effectively. And um, I think this code for most of for most of the audience, this is this code is so simple, and um, there would not be any kind of misinformation inside this. And this is actual code. And by using this code, whoops, actually, using this code, this can be uh, decoded like this. But uh, before explaining this, I, I'm going to explain uh, another piece of code. And remember that after the separator of all those heads apart, this character has to be parsed so that the what kind of message is, uh, is conveyed, conveyed through, through this, uh, this information part uh, um, should be decided. So I use a very simple pattern matching here, 8 bit of type, and the rest for binary. Allen is actually very, very good at this. And you just uh, put the type and the rest of the information into another function. And the, on, the, on the other function called the info dispatch type here, and you pattern match with, uh, um, if, if, for example, if, the, if it has exclamation mark like the, the, uh, right here, then you can pass it on to another, another dedicated function to pass the all the information. This code is so simple. And I, I really like Erlang. And actually, I, I've, been, uh, I've been taught about this from Joe over there uh, in, in, his, in his book on programming online. There are lots of examples like this. Okay. So, if I, so let me show you. To decode this, um, <coughs> when you decode this, you have the source field called F4, F4BSX. This is a cosine of presumably France sta station in France. It begins with F. And this destination part is a kind of the, what do you say, group identifier of, of trying to identify some recipients, some set of recipients. I don't know what that is, but some set of recipients, because this is not a real cosine. <coughs> and on the relay part, I put all the binaries as a list so that I can pick them up later and process it individually. And this is the info part from the 
this is the equal sign, and you put the, all those uh, latitude and long longitude strings. Then, after decoding this, I get, uh, I, I, in, in the software, I can create some tuple. Actually, this is uh, not long route. This, this should be a lot long, but whatever. Um, this string, OK, let me show you. This string over here corresponds to the uh, latitude of 43.22 degrees north. And this string over here <coughs> is, whoa, excuse me. It's pretty hard to <laughs> decipher by myself. Yeah, this string over here is actually for, for this um, longitude of 1.57 degrees in the east. And um, by looking at that, things are encoded in a fixed point, fixed point numbers manner. manner. So um, um, it's I in the in the source code, you have to do a little bit complicated <laughs> things to do this, but uh, it's not that hard to get this information from uh, every part every packet of the APRSIS, okay? So store in the position in the ETS. You create a name, ta name table, and um, I, I want to actually expire all the information in ETS if the information takes uh, a certain, certain amount of minutes. In, my, in this case, three minutes. So I put the early monotonic time it's not Allen now. Uh, Allen now is already deprecated. Don't use that. Allen monotonic time. This is much, much better system call. And uh, on, on the millisecond resolution, just in case, it could be second or it could be microsecond, but the millisecond <coughs> would, be better, would, be, would fit very well in this case. And I put the EDS uh, um, time and source and all those decoded data as a tuple of four element tuple here. So this is an example. Um, for some unknown reason, all the uh, monotonic time values are minus. Uh, actually, 64-bit va negative value. But uh, it's increasing, so no problem. And um, this is a cosine of SR3 now. Actually, this is a <coughs> Polish cosine. And uh, latitude, longitude. Okay. So this HS stuff is, um, this HS station is in uh, Thailand, presumably. And this would be in the United States, presumably. So, OK, and um, I'd, like to, I'd like to introduce this function. If you want to dump all the table conveniently, use ETS tab tool list. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a very convenient function so for, for debugging and also for the production. Uh, so that dumping all the data at once, and uh, later you can process it. So how to purge all the older ETS data? Uh, you have to do per parse transform, um, because you are using the fun2ms pattern matching. And um, this pattern, this function-like, um, what do you say, Fun function-like code here is actually um, making a condition that the time recorded in ETS is uh, older than the absolute value of the monotonic time now in millisecond. And in millisecond, it's 180,000, means three minutes, three minutes ago. Okay? And um, you cannot put this, this t equal. Uh, expression inside here directory because uh, when you uh, if you if you try this actually this time stuff is compiled into the something like constant so every time this t value changes so uh, you have to put the t value separately separately in the in the font to ms right here okay all right this is so this ends up explanation of the Allen part, and I'd like to explain the elixir part. And the elixir part um, is, since the elixir part is 
uh, invoked as an application, it starts the LLM part and web server. And when requested, the Elixir part creates the position data for a framework called Leaflet. I will explain the Leaflet later. And the Elixir part res will respond with all the headers and scripts of Leaflet as HTML, a complete HTML. OK, um, this is a simple server made in Plug. It's not even in Phoenix. Plug is, uh, pl pl plug is uh, what do you say, element of, element of uh, Phoenix, and the plug is much simpler. And uh, what you do is that you use uh, some module called the plug static, which generates the old, which, which gives you all the given data in the static file system into the web server, uh, I mean, uh, HTTP, so that uh, you can um, send the information of the, all the JavaScript frameworks or other static data. And <coughs> if, you, if, you, if the request URL is different from this, it's just forward it to the uh, mapping actual module so that the mapping module can give you the uh, contents of the ETS. Okay, and um, if you, and um, Elixir has a very convenient uh, function called template. And um, sorry, this is going to be a this is going to be a low part of this screen, but um, the key point here is that by using this template, you can generate the pop-up string for a marker in the map and put the, generate the, uh, put the numbers in a piece of JavaScript code so that the, this, Java, when Java, this JavaScript code is Interpret, interpret, then interpreted, then um, a marker with a pop-up functionality will emerge. Okay. So this is a this is an example of the uh, excerpt of the generate, uh, generated HTML. This is the header part, actually a fixed part, and this is the uh, actually um, ETS data part. It's from uh, it's, it said ZR, and this is actually a prefix for Brazil, Brazilian station, <coughs> so that the latitude is minus. Minus means the southern, in the southern hemisphere. Okay. And this is the generic part. And let me explain about the leaflet. Leaflet is a very convenient piece of program. It's an it's an MIT license, and um, you you don't have to use a Google Map. For example, this, actually, this map is an open street map. But you can use Google Map also uh, by adding a special plugin design, also licensed as MIT license. Okay. It's, called a, it's called a leaflet grid, ra grid layer Google Mutant. I don't know why it's called Google Mutant, but whatever. So this is an example result of um, when, you, when you access to a certain URL, maybe you know, on the local server. Then, uh, lots of stations are coming. Actually, these are positions of the stations. Okay. And for Sweden, even in Sweden, um, not so many, but uh, even Stockholm is over here. And in and even at the northern part of the Sweden, there's a station called SM2FXT which is in the position of latitude of 6.74 degrees and longitude of 20.95 degrees. And this is a pop-up text within the um, HTML returned from the um, Elixir code. When you click it, it just show up. When you click it once again, it just, it just close. It's a functionality of leaflet. It's not the functionality of the Elixir code, but the um, leaflet is so convenient do, to do this kind of experimental or tiny prototyping. Okay, so how much code lines are needed for the, this software? The number of lines is very small. Okay, um, all code is 288 lines, Elixir code 121 lines, and the EX templa template 31 lines. It, it's only 440 lines. Short, short is good, less error, Less bugs, easy to read, and um, I think that's, I think this is the power of the Erlang Elixir. Okay. 
All right. Um, this, is a, this is kind of a hobbyist presentation, but I'd like to emphasize uh, ser several things. Alex, um, I'm sorry. Beam is for large scale and high concurrency software. Beam is very, Beam has a huge potential. But the potential is not restricted to the large scale system. You can also utilize it for a small, small <coughs> project. And starting small with Beam languages such as Erlang or Excel or LFE or whatever, um, you can prototype very quickly, and that is good. And you can use Beam. Uh, and, uh, the good thing about Erlang and Elixir is that they can be together in the same project so nicely, uh, thanks to the modern build tool like Mix or River 3. Of course, there are lots of problems sometimes you have to solve, but uh, it's much easier than two years ago or even more easier than five years ago. So I suggest you to give it a try. Okay. And this is a URL. Uh, at the GitHub of my project. And um, before concluding the project presentation, I'd like to thank my sponsor, uh, the GMO Pepabo. GMO Pepabo is a web service provider in Japan, who, who, which has the um, R&D Institute, uh, who supports my activity on research and development. And I thank the GMO Pepabo for this, for uh, and allow me to do this. And, and as always, Code Me Crew and our own solutions. And I thank you for being here.